work of your Son. We have seen his glory, the glory as of the one and only, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And as we come tonight, and as we seek to bow in your presence, our hearts to be bowed down before you, hear us, Lord, as we pray for that sense and awareness of your majesty and greatness, filling the house and filling our hearts, that we too might be able to follow what the psalmist was talking about. We've maybe known something of it before, but we'd rest to somewhat dissatisfied until we would see something of you once again. And it wasn't a rare thing for the psalmist to talk like this. In the 63rd Psalm, he says something similar out in the wilderness of Judea, remembering your house and remembering that that was the place that he had seen your glory. It's not that you had manifested yourself in any physical or tangible way. But through the whole encounter that he had, someone like Asaph in Psalm 73, he said, when I went into the house of God, things changed. <laughs> For him, there was a revelation through meeting you that led him to come face to face with his own end and with that of others. And the fact that he'd been envying people who in their sin, he says, and in their wickedness, were prospering. And he had a great struggle of wondering why he, as he said at the time, why he had washed his hands in vain. The thought of making himself different by your grace and power from the rest of the world. But he thought, what's the point if I suffer more than they do? But it's when he came to your house, everything changed. And so we so often need that. We can be preoccupied with things, can be distracted. Things can be distorted. They might not be real as they are, or we might form an opinion of something or a situation. First and foremost of ourselves, to only discover the reality in your word and to meet someone like Isaiah in the vision in chapter 6 of his prophecy when he met with you. He really met with himself. And it wasn't the first time in his life but when you were setting him aside to that the future that you had for him, it's through that encounter with you that he was more prepared for it. So tonight, Lord, that we wouldn't be leaving your house or going away unaffected, but that we may be truly able to say all of us from our hearts that surely the Lord was in that place. And so may your presence be with us in our lives. May we carry that, what Paul describes in the New Testament, as that fragrance, as that perfume, as that aroma that is unmistakably heavenly. We've known people who seem to, as it were, bring your presence where they went. You were clearly with them. For Moses, it was a face shining, symbolizing that he had been in your presence and looking at your face. The people were scared, but there's others. We think of Stephen in the New Testament when he's on trial, falsely accused of everything. And his accusers, we tell, you tell us through Luke, they looked on him. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. The reason for that earlier in the book, when Stephen and the others were chosen by you to be the deacons, one of the marks, qualifications the people were to look for, which was obviously discernible. Whatever that means for us, Lord, we search it out. Is that they were to be full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. And so that heavenliness that was about them, even their enemies couldn't resist. That's exactly what you said to them. That you would give them a mouth and an authority, a wisdom that even their enemies couldn't resist. And maybe we've known something in a very small way of that, of not knowing what to say at times. Like in the, in, the, in the psalm we've been singing, feeling maybe at work or maybe even at home or whatever the context, feeling isolated, not only that, but feeling isolated through feeling surrounded. And when there may be threats, maybe not to personal harm as such, but the subtle insinuation, the subtle, as it were, dripping of the tap of opposition that in its way can wear us down just as much maybe even more so than if it was a direct onslaught. Where patience 
and perseverance can all be tried. Sometimes when your people pray for faith, you bring them into situations that have the great potential to challenge their faith and make them doubt and disbelieve. Where we want or maybe ask to be more loving and Christ-like, you face us with opposition and people to deal with that we feel we can't. Or when it's patience, it may be through suffering. When it's joy we seek, it may be through sadness that we discover it. And seeking that light and that heavenliness and that liberty, it may be through the darkness and all the feelings of bondage. You're so wise, it's not that you answer us, Lord, in this way that if we ask for one thing, you give us the opposite to teach us a lesson. But sometimes it's what you do. And whatever it is, whatever course you take in our lives, not only is it perfect and expressive of your character, but we have to believe, even if we feel we can't, we have to believe what Job said about you when he couldn't make sense of anything else in his life. His confidence in you seemed to be stripped. His understanding of you seemed to vanish. And yet he, he knew that you were in control. And he had these flashes we thank you for these flashes of insight and inspiration you gave him. Like one occasion, he said that when you have tried him, he would come forth like gold that you are. And centuries later, revealed yourself in the prophets to be like the refiner of gold and silver. The prophets describe you bringing your people through the fire. And we see in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, exactly that. You will purify the sons of Levi that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Which seems to be telling us, Lord, that prior to that, the offering wasn't righteous. But only through the purifying process did you change and make them more able to offer and render to you that service. So you're truly amazing, even read the New Testament, when you chastise and bring uh, difficulties into your people's lives to teach and correct as a father will their children. The writer there to Hebrews explains it as a grievous thing. It's not pleasant. It's grievous. We really can feel the pain. But it's through these ways and means that you show your love for your people. And not only, though it doesn't seem maybe to, to feel like love at the time, it might feel like rejection. But at the same time, the process, like Job was saying, I'll come out like forth like gold. It's exactly what you're doing, that in Hebrews there we read that while earthly fathers will do it for their own reasons to, to help us best they can, you do it for our profit. And what profit it is when we're told there that we may partake of your holiness. It's hard for us to see the outcome sometimes. It's hard for us to see the end. The Lord is often where we want to look. The question why and how long and such. When uh, though these questions express the words of your people recorded in the Bible from the very Old Testament times right through. And even Mary and Martha questioning you about Lazarus. If you had been here, they said, both of them, my brother would not have died. They thought that you had ulterior motives in delaying, motives that they questioned. And while in their better moments, they'd never question you. And in their better moments, we wouldn't either. But sometimes there can be these intense moments when we do. And you explain to them that glory was coming out of that situation. And so it will. It always will. Because you always work together for good. Everything in the lives of those who love you, who are the called, according to your purpose. We need to believe this and strengthen the faith of any who may be seeming or feeling like they're just hanging on. Taking a step forward and ten back. Sometimes feeling, getting the head above the water as it were, only to feel another wave coming. And the next believer maybe doesn't have a clue. And they think, as we all have, and all sadly and confess the sin of this, Lord, we maybe think we know. But whatever we don't understand and however we can't enter into something of 
that we would, we would pray to when we try and pray for one another when there is suffering, but above everything, you are the one who knows. We don't have a great high priest who cannot be touched with a feeling of our infirmities or weaknesses, weaknesses that don't arise as a result of a sinful nature inherited from Adam or as a result of sinful thought, words, and deeds. But you know weakness like we can't. And you know us as one who doesn't learn by observation. You are one who has made us and shaped our lives, our very personalities, our very bodies, our everything about us. And even to think about the very things that people might reject us for, if that's the case, to be comforted knowing that you've made us as we are. Not only comforted in knowing it, but to have the strength to accept and adopt that into our lives. Because they are like David saying to you in Psalm 27, he wasn't going to be scared. He said, the Lord is my light and the Lord is my salvation. And the next breath he says, whom shall I fear? He was in a unique place. But so are all of your people. We're not all kings. None of us are in, in, a, in one sense. The spiritual sense is different, you tell us, but ruling and reigning and being kings and priests unto our God. One day, the fulfillment will come in that royal service in heaven. But for now, it can be so different. And we pray, Lord, for your people, particularly people who are suffering and maybe feeling rejection, even in the church. We ask, Lord, that you will be near to any who are suffering and there are so many we can think of and we pray for Lord the suffering in families individual lives uh, suffering with illnesses of different sorts suffering with unanswered symptoms maybe unexplored medicines and the knockbacks these things can bring we pray for your help and guidance for all who are involved in medicine and diagnosis and all these things, we thank you for the gifts of caring, the gifts of nursing and being doctors and surgeons and consultants and specialists, all of these amazing things. That, that's only, only maybe at some times in, in life, like with so much, that we can truly appreciate. But Lord, we pray that as you are the great healer, that you will, through the means that you choose, or even when you don't choose any means, to send healing and to give restoration of health, of mind, of body, to restore souls, to give spiritual strength, to mount up with wings like eagles. And asking, Lord, for all who are downcast, frustrated, who are angry, who are bitter, one of the worst categories, Lord, we we fear maybe more than anything ever happening to us and how frightening it can be to see not frightening in the sense of cowering from it but frightening to see the fact of it that even among your people there can be such a bitterness and a lashing out for no reason but Lord as you know our natures the reasons for the bitterness can be so deep and so obvious and real to the individual and they might never have the strength to share it. Maybe, maybe they shouldn't anyway. Maybe it's not. But knowing what it is to have someone listen and to unburden, to cast their burdens on the Lord. But also there we're told in the New Testament to bear one another's burdens. And if we don't know them, we can't bear them for each other. We can't share them. We can't, as it were, half the burden and carry the load. And we might be wondering what's wrong with people. And forgive us, Lord, when we give the wrong impressions, say the wrong things, and ask for your blessing to accompany all that is done in your name. We thank, Lord, of the coming communions throughout the presbytery. We thank you for this time. Ask for your blessing on all the services and the fellowship. The church would come together and unite in worship and remembrance. Asking, Lord, that your greatness and your glory and grace and your loving kindness will be revealed through these times, that we will be reminded and to be refreshed and revived in a world that is so negative 
a world that is so despairing in itself with man-made objectives and, and answers and solutions which are doomed to fail in so many ways because they ignore the very origin of the problem they're trying to deal with. And the problem is themselves. The problem is us. We are at the very heart of the human problem. The problem of our hearts, as somebody else said. And so, oh Lord, for that work of grace in our rulers and people in authority, at, at every level in society, those that are involved in education and science, as well as in politics and all the wider spheres of influence and authority, we pray that, Lord, what has been so disintegrated and what has been attacked and sought to be demolished, the very integrity of your ordination of the family. And to think, Lord, of schools in places not only teaching things, but to conceal a child's intention or a child's, a child's, when we even think of it, self-identification and to keep parents from knowing what they've said or what they're thinking. For the state to think or the government to think and have policies that they can tell us what to do when they are elected by us, even if it wasn't our own, as it were, vote that, or cross in the box or whatever that got them into power. It's, it's not that they exist for themselves or that we exist for them, but this is where the tyranny is showing itself. It's where they can do what they want. We saw it through COVID, all these lockdowns, and there's the health secretary and all the rest of them parting. And when they're caught to make excuses, committing <laughs> sin behind the scenes, which what you said in Deuteronomy, if I remember right, be sure your sins will find you out. But nothing's done because there's corruption. And here we are on the receiving end being locked down and told to stay at home. And there they are justifying what they're doing. And we hear about it and then it's gone. Lord, we ask for a moving of your great power that you would energize your church and your people feeling like we do, like the, the, valley, the, the bones that Ezekiel's on in the valley in the 37th chapter of his prophecy, the bleached, the disintegrated bodies, the bleached bones, no more tendons, no, nothing but bones. And you said to the prophet, son of man, can, shall these bones, can these bones live? And we wish we could have seen his face, but then maybe his answer says it all when he said, Lord, you know because you did know. And that valley of bones symbolizing Israel in their deadened state, their powerless state, relics of a past, carrying on, it would seem, what was now, intended to carry on what was now, so powerless. But it's there you told them to speak and you told them to prophesy. And the winds came and the bones became connected. The sinews joined them. The tendons joined them. The skin covered them. And then he was told to call for the winds to come. And through the process, a great army emerges. You are able to do this. We're reading about it tonight in Acts. That you are able to do for your people more than they could ask or ever think. And living and functioning and trying to proclaim your word in hostile situations. Never stop them. And it mustn't stop us. So, Lord, encourage us. Tonight we pray, and everywhere your word is, is read and studied tonight, we pray, not just tonight, but throughout all the world, and as people will be meeting at different times geographically, we thank you for that and pray for all the gatherings of the church for your blessing. We pray that you remember us as we meet, as we pray for those who can't be out, whose prayers are with us, whose prayers are invested in our worship. May they be conscious, although we haven't got the live stream just now, even as in, in whatever way, if they follow another one just now, or, or you know our people, Lord, we pray for them particularly, and you're gracious, drawing near to them, they may be conscious of that sense of being in the spirit too. And all who need you, we pray for them. Remember us in this new week. May your blessing be upon our lives. We think at times of the prayer Jabez made in the Old Testament, which said so much 
in saying so little. And he asked that you would bless him indeed, that you would extend his territory, that you would keep him from evil. And as he was praying to you, it seemed to be so simple, but it covered everything. The wonder, Lord, as you gave him his request. And what we might be praying for and waiting for, you have reserved in your hand to give or withhold. And in that we pray for strength and for wisdom and for grace. And through our interaction with you in scripture and seeking you in prayer that we would be glad knowing the will of the Lord is being done. Hear us as we call to you, grant your blessing, and may we sense that we're here for you and that you are in our midst, where two or three meet. And we ask all in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Let's turn to Psalm 147, 147. We're going to sing Psalms again just now. This is on page 192. 147, page 192. We sing verses 1 to 7. We'll praise the Lord. How good it is to sing him songs of praise. How pleasant to give thanks to him for all his gracious ways. There at verse 7, sing to the Lord with thankfulness. With joy his praise proclaim. And with the music of his harp, of the harp, give glory to his name. Verses 1 to 7. Let's sing Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing Him songs of praise. How pleasant to give thanks to Him for all His gracious ways. Let's read together from Acts, the book of Acts, chapter 13. Acts 13, and from the beginning of the chapter. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, 
my name, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they saved the Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamas, the magician, for that's the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga and Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem, but they went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After reading, after the reading from the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent a message to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, say it. So Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made them and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with uplifted arm, he led them out of it. And for about 40 years, he put up with them in the wilderness. And after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave them their land as an inheritance. All this took about 450 years. And after that, he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king. And God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, the man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. Of this man's offspring, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. Before his coming, John had proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, and as John was finishing his course, he said, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. No, but behold, after me one is coming, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to us has been sent the message of this salvation. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled them by condemning him. And though they found in him no guilt worthy of death, they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they had carried out all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who had come up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. As also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way, I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore he says also in another Psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which he could not be freed by the law of Moses. 
Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophets should come about. Look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish. For I am working a work in your days, a work that you will not believe, even if one tells it to you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men, and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so on. May God bless these words to us as we read this evening. Let's turn to Psalm 22, 22nd Psalm. Scottish Psalter, and this is page 228, 228. We're going to sing from verse 27. A messianic psalm, and this section from verse 27 to the end is the exaltation and the outcome of the exaltation of Christ. The nations will come. This week in verse 27, all ends of the earth remember shall and turn the Lord unto. All kindreds of the nations to him shall homage do. And the last verse, they shall come and they shall declare his truth and righteousness unto a people yet unborn. And that he hath done this. Let's sing these verses from 27 to the end of Psalm 22. All ends of the earth remember shall. All ends of the earth remember shall. And turn the Lord unto all kindred. Before a generation. 
let's come back to our reading, shall we, in the book of Acts 13. You can read again verses 32 and 33. We didn't quite reach these verses last Sunday evening. This is where we wish to be, God willing, around this section. Verses 32, 33, and, and, and we, Paul says, We bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, what he's been talking about up till now, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Sometimes people wonder about, you know, at communions and when you have the children around. And they often ask a visiting minister, what's their favorite chapter or their favorite verse or favorite psalm? Or is there anything that's maybe more, uh, stands out to them more than others? And it gets you thinking. I don't know if you have a favorite, the young ones have a favorite they can think of themselves. Nothing wrong with having parts that are more important to you than others. The reason you say that is not that they're, they're better, it's that they mean more to you because they maybe have been helpful at a certain time in your life. You may be growing up and there's a, a psalm you can think of or some verses and that's all good and, and important so that we can remember these things and learn them and, and uh, hold on to them for when we're growing up. One of my favorites, you maybe guessed this, is the, is the book of Acts. And by favorites, it's, it's a glorious book. Every book in the Bible is glorious, but when we read in, for example, Psalm 68 about God marching through the wilderness with his people on their journey from Egypt to the promised land, it's very descriptive about the earth shaking, Sinai shaking, the presence of God being so obvious and tangible. Not that you could put your hand out and feel God like you can put your hand out and touch or about the seat that you're sitting on, whatever it is. You know, what, what we mean by tangible, it's, it's not... It's not that God in any way can be seen with physical eyes in his own essence or touched with physical hands, which isn't to say that his presence cannot be so emphatic that we feel it. Remember reading together the other Sunday, we were thinking about um, Paul's farewell to Timothy, or a farewell of sorts, and he talks about his first experience in this present um, arraignment and has been attacked and been threatened and having to answer for himself and he said in my first defense no one stood everyone forsook me remember he said but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me he was very very conscious of the presence of the Lord who was in heaven at the time that is as though he was right beside him he felt he recognized he knew the presence of the Lord the book of Acts shows among many other things, how the Lord is present with his church in the different and the changing and the shifting situations, which is thrilling because, I mean, it's really confusing. When, in one sense, it's not confusing when you see kind of right from wrong, but in another sense, it can be very confusing when there's such an amount and such a variety of churches to choose from. You, you think of that. People decide, and you know, the mainland kind of cities, and of course, you're it, it, it's maybe not, um, you know, it, it's one that fits in for this or one that fits in for that. That's another issue. And, and uh, you can even, well, you can, you can think yourself maybe of experiences you've had. And one thing is for us to go to another church and, and feel it doesn't feel like a church. Is that right? Well, it's right to you or to me. It's, but the reason we feel that is maybe because it's different. And different doesn't mean wrong. Someone once actually, he said a, a very searching statement in, in one of his, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's a challenging look at some of Paul's, the, the churches in, in the Bible around the, the ministry of Paul. And he was asked if, if he was to visit our church, let's imagine the apostle Paul came in here. <laughs> I, I'm not saying either way, but this is what the man was saying. And if he looked at the church, would he recognize that is the church that I recognize? Now, in one sense, it doesn't matter what Paul would say. In one sense. If it were an opinion. But what's behind what the man is saying is that there is the person used by God to found the churches and 
you know, how, how the church looked. And, and Acts shows us, if we just read the letter she writes to the church at Ephesus, at Philippi, at Colossae, at Thessalonica, um, first and second letter she writes to some of them, we'd, we'd, we'd come away with a certain amount of understanding, but not maybe with a full picture. But Acts shows us sometimes how these churches came into being and how they functioned and some of the troubles and the problems may be referred to in the apostolic letters that they, they are um, spelled out. You, you can think of the sufferings Paul lists on one, one occasion he talks in Second Corinthians 12 and he's talking about being led out in a basket. And by itself you maybe wonder what it means but you take Acts and tie the whole thing together and it makes more sense. But the book of Acts is showing the presence and the power of the Lord in, in different situations. The life of the Holy Spirit, the presence of the Holy Spirit coming to expression in different locations and converting people. And that's going to involve differences. And, um, you know, an argument has been made. And, and this, is, this is, in all of these, it's neither here nor there because everyone has their own ideas and, and thoughts about it. But one problem some have uh, noticed with even with mission work in foreign lands that it involved almost uh, a carrying of the Western or the British culture into a foreign culture. And the intention was maybe, and this, when you think of the intention to Christianize and uh, to apply Christian biblical principles to different levels of society and experience, um, the intention was good, but really it was an exporting of a culture and imposing it on others. And, you know, that's another issue. Someone's written a book, Paul's Missionary Methods and Ours. So it's good to always evaluate these things. And by doing that, we have to come back to the book. It's the only way we can try working things out and making sense of what God is saying. And, and it can happen as well when it comes to understanding certain verses or certain passages. The verse referred to in verse 33 is the seventh verse in Psalm 2. You are my son, today I have begotten you. And maybe reading it, Casually reading it, we won't notice the verse. Maybe reading it again, we'll think, how does that refer to God raising Jesus from the dead? But that's the whole point of it. We come sometimes to the Bible with our mind made up about what the Bible means. And um, in that sense, we try and, f we try and see, not, not try and fit, but maybe we try and see how a verse will fit into a certain, you know, one thing is not a negative at all, but sometimes we can proof text statements with the Bible. And, and the reason it's trying to cover that is not a wrong thing in, in its own way at, at all. How the catechisms later, the shorter catechism, and there's the, um, I don't know if you maybe remember that the edition, the Roderick Lawson edition, well, growing up and would have the scripture proof text and some comments, but the verses below back up the statements made in the main part of the text. So that if you're wondering, is, is, what, is what this is saying actually in the Bible? The answer is yes, and you can go and, and search it out. When it comes to a verse like this, it's like other verses in the Bible that, that maybe have been thought to, to proof text a certain teaching. And one such, you've maybe heard of it, is that this verse, Psalm 2, verse 7, is quoted in verse 33 here, is sometimes referred to as being or providing a biblical basis for what's called the eternal generation of the Son. You are my Son, this day I have begotten you. The Father and the Son. The Father begetting the Son and making that declaration. And when he says, because they are eternal persons, today I have begotten you, the argument has sometimes been put that the day must be the day of eternity. An eternal day. You even think of some of the greats like Louis Berkhoff talking about the subject. You get lost in it, but the human mind can't go into the subject. Sometimes people approach it and they get, when you listen and, and, and follow the strands of thought, it highlights how human logic cannot go there. Even to think of it like this, just to maybe in, in the whole argument, please, if you'd wish, listen to say don't look into it and don't work through it, and, and not that at all, but, but when we come to conclusions, just give you an example of it, you'll have... You'll have um, someone like John Calvin who will take an issue with some of the earlier creeds that will say that the Son is very God, of very God. Now, Calvin, John Calvin, would make, was making the distinction between 
the essence and the person of the Son being given to the Son by the Father. You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Begotten what? When was this begetting? Well, the argument is it had to be in eternity because there is no past, present, future with God. That's the argument. And because of that, Berkov working this out, Louis Berkov speaks about it as an unbeginning and a completed act. It's something, if you think about it, if you think about it as an eternal act, that itself throws all sorts of questions in, the, in, in logic. An eternal act. If it's an act that's eternal, and this is the whole point, when did it begin? When did it end? Is it ongoing? Well, no, it's eternal. And so you see where it goes. And these are, these are fascinating subjects. And great minds like Berkov and others, and they, they work it all out. And it's always good to come across some. I commend this to you if you would. I'm not sure how available this book is. It was a man called um, Robert Raymond, A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith. A reason, it was amazing but at, at, at the Inverness Communions recently that the minister there was, and his wife, they were saying they, they knew him. Couldn't believe it. That they met him, that he'd been in their house. And this, this man that, that um, maybe isn't as, as famous in some circles, not that famous, the thing's the wrong word, but well known. But he'd often, in his writings and in his theology, teaching a generation of students from ministry, he'd challenge, not to think outside the box, but to look at things and to actually ask questions of them. Every teacher should do that. You've maybe, and I've definitely had, you know, the red pen through it when you thought you're meant to, university was like, you thought you meant to say what you think, then you soon learn, no, it's to show you understand what you're taught. And there's a way of going around disagreeing and all the rest of it. But this man was encouraging. And one of the subjects, it's even arguing, you think, because when you think about it, what we're not trying to say is, is that, uh, that this verse is saying eternal generation isn't true. But what we're trying to show is that this verse is not talking about eternal generation at all. So when you think God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, you've the boys have heard of that. We've heard of that. His only, the old Bible, his only begotten son. It's a Greek word, two words combined. It means only begotten, only generated, the unique. And sometimes to try and understand that, the reference will go back to, to Abraham and God speaking to Abraham about, about Isaac, your only Isaac. He wasn't his only son, but he was special. He was unique. He was the son of promise. Raymond and others would carry that term, that ideal, ideas into the terminology only begotten. But that's another subject. And if you've engaged in these kind of, it's fascinating. And it's always good in, to talk through these things with others. So in what, in what sense then should we understand this, this verse Verse 7 of Psalm 2. Well, Pete, uh, Paul is explaining very clearly. And, and just by, by saying he's explaining very clearly, if you'd read it yourself, and I read it, you'll see he's talking about resurrection before he quotes the verse. Even prior to that, he's referring to the Old Testament and how the Jewish authorities who have the, is in verse 27, who have the Bible read to them. And he says, who... Those who live in Jerusalem and the rulers, because they didn't recognize him, nor understand the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath. Turning up and hearing the Bible and going away and saying, I haven't a clue what that's talking about. We maybe think, you know, we maybe think, and, and it can be at times like funeral times and, and families have to meet and gather and they're not bothered in a sense. Some of the people who aren't Christians for meaning. You can maybe remember that and maybe been among people who wouldn't even go into the church and just wait for the procession. Because it's, if we don't understand the Bible, we're almost happy about it. Almost. But there's others, and they're referred to, referred to in the chapter as, um, as those who feared God. He refers to them as brothers. And uh, those among you who fear God, he's making it clear that there are those people among the Jewish congregants in the synagogue there in uh, Antioch Pisidia who are Gentiles but who have joined themselves to the Jewish way and they're waiting for ultimately the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah and Paul is reasoning that with them and he's saying to them see amazingly he takes the scriptures and he explains the scriptures to them and through the explanation there's going to be conviction 
He's saying to them in verse 27, you've got the word read to you, Sabbath after Sabbath, but you don't have a clue what the word's talking about. Because what you've done, he said, you fulfilled the utterances of the prophets by condemning the Son of God the prophets were announcing because you didn't recognize him. You thought you knew what he was like. You thought what to expect of him, but when he appeared, they thought of the exalted Messiah. They didn't realize the, the humble and, and the lowly in the state of humiliation. They didn't see, they couldn't understand. Well, they did when their eyes were opened. But in a wonderful thing, like all of us, when God changes our uh, understanding and we see the truth as it is in Jesus. But verse 29 is showing this. This is the resurrection aspect where... Uh, the emphasis is coming down on the fact that they were involved in his crucifixion. They carried out all that was written of him. Yeah, that should get the Jews thinking. It should get these, you know, religious-minded, Bible-believing, shall we say, people to actually stop and consider. Because he's, um, he's, he's not implying, he's, he's clearly telling them that those who knew the Bible in their own heads but never realized or understood it in its meaning in their hearts, were responsible for crucifying their Messiah. But, verse 30 says, God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to the others. Around 500 people were told, 1 Corinthians 15. And verse 32 is saying this, We bring you the good news. The good news is what? That what God promised to the fathers, what? Well, here it is. This he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. It's not the crucifixion or his death that led to the end or the ultimate goal of God's plan for the Messiah, or for his people. It was through resurrection and through exaltation. And people sometimes, and, and if you'd look into this, I mean, you maybe have, so I don't mean to say it like that, but sometimes people will say, in case you're not aware of this, I hadn't really thought of it, but some will say that verse 33, that when we're told that the Father raised Jesus, as it is written in the second Psalm, some people make that a proof text, not for eternal generation, pre-creation, Trinitarian relationship between Father and Son, but they look at this as the incarnation, God sending his Son into the world, becoming man. Now, people make arguments. Now, this is the thing of taking a verse, or two verses and leaving the rest of the chapter. It has to be the case. Some, sometimes, <coughs> sometimes the meaning can be more clear in fewer verses, but the section here is clearly what goes before and what comes after is clearly talking about the resurrection. It's not the, the eternal generation. It isn't the incarnation. It has to be the resurrection. This God has fulfilled to us, the children of the prophets, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Whatever that verse means, Psalm 2, verse 7, it is talking about the resurrection. That's what Paul is saying. It's referred to, I think, 14 times or alluded to in the New Testament, more than any other Old Testament Psalm. But if you'd search out all the references, there's one, I think, in Hebrews 5. There's one in Hebrews 1, where Christ, who is called the Son, to which of... Well, it's talking about Psalm 110, but you'll see it in chapter 1 of Hebrews, the, the reference, the allusion there, and also in chapter 5, that Christ didn't exalt himself to be made a high priest, but he was appointed by the one who said, you are my son. Now, that declaration of uh, Christ not appointing himself and, and the quotation of Psalm 2, if you look at it in Hebrews 5, it's, it's not saying the same thing. It's speaking of his identity. It's not saying when the Father said this or what the Father said it about, but the fact that the Father has said it proves who the Son is. We know this is resurrection language from verse 34. And as for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no eternal generation, no incarnation being referred to, but the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to see corruption, he quotes from the Old Testament and then verse 35 from Psalm 16 as well. It is the father raising the son that's being referred to in these verses. Which maybe leads us to the question, how do the verses mean that? How can being begotten or becoming the son have any 
historical fulfillment on the day of the resurrection. Well, it's not talking about anything other than what the words open with. You are my son. We're missing the point if we get bogged down with today I have begotten you. And the reason for that, if you look in, in well, there's many reasons, no, but one reason I mean to say, not one reason, is if, in a, for example, like in the Gospel of Matthew, the opening chapters, if you look at some of the quotations he takes from the Old Testament, you won't find them word for word, nor will their original context maybe suggest the meaning that Matthew takes. All that's to say is, it's to always be open to what the Bible says about itself and how the scripture explains itself. And um, in, in that sense, to come to clarity and understanding of, of what's being referred to the context. One of the, one of the reasons, if we just read this, we'll, we'll finish in just a minute. It's in Romans 1. And um, the idea, I think, is of declaration. It's not that the father constituted or made the son to be the son of the resurrection or that the, or even could it ever be argued that the, the Father made the Son the Son through eternal generation? Because they are the same in substance, equal in power and glory, and have been forever. So we bog ourselves down and we try and figure this out rather than let the Bible speak to us. And even if we're left with massive gaps in our understanding, they might be filled gradually. But um, as long as we, we come to the, the essence of what's being said, Romans 1. Uh, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Here it is. The gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. You're hearing the sermon in, in Pisidian Antioch, aren't you? You can hear the same thing. He's talking here to Romans, but he's talking there to, to Jewish people. Concerning his son, the prophet spoke. Here it is. Who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of Holiness, the Holy Spirit, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. He didn't become the Son of God at resurrection. It wasn't the first time the Father declared him to be the Son of God. Think of his Think of his baptism and the Mount of Transfiguration. But it was through the resurrection the Father was declaring to the whole world, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Whatever you maybe think of what that's referring to or how it refers to resurrection in the application that's made by the New Testament writers, that doesn't matter. It's to know what's actually being said declared by the Father to be the Son of God. How? According to the, with power, in power, according to the spirit of holiness. It's holiness that defines the spirit being referred to. It's that quality that distinguishes him, not as unique to him, but he is the one described as the one creating holiness in the people of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, the Father and Son are holy, but it is the appointment, the prerogative, the mission of the Holy Spirit to bring that holiness, among other things, into the people of God. The Father declares through the mighty power of the Holy Spirit and by the resurrection from the dead, the way verse 4 in Romans 1 ends, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For this reason, Philippians 2 says, God has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Father raising the Son. The Son is said to raise by himself and by others at times to raise himself. In Romans 8 as well, there's that verse, there's the, there's, there's the three are actually referred to in different ways. The Father raising the Son, the Son raising himself, and the Holy Spirit's involvement. But the Father, you know, places that emphasis. I don't know, was it Finlayson who spoke of the day of Pentecost? The coming of the Holy Spirit acts too as the Father's receipt that the work had been paid in full. That's what Peter says in Acts 2 earlier on in this book. It's a fulfillment. It's God saying, it's God endorsing, and it's God 
declaring publicly that this is my son. Quite a thought, isn't it? The book of Acts shows the way the power of the Holy Spirit works. Different places. There's Paul and his companions, and they reach this Antioch and Pisidia, and they're thrown out of the synagogue. That's where they were going. They're a ready-made congregation. They're thrown out. And when they're thrown out, is that the end of the work? It's only the beginning. It's tragic for the Gentiles, uh, for the Jews as they go to the Gentiles. But no, if you read the end of the chapter, imagine God saying this like he said to these people. Quoting from the Old Testament as they do, they say, we're going to the Gentiles. You've had your time. Seeing, he said, that you count yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Keep pushing it away from you, he's saying. And you're judging yourself not worthy of this gift. It's a gift of grace, and we think we've earned it. And Paul is reasoning with them. The gospel frees you from what the law of Moses could never free you from. Bondage, death. You'll never attain it. You'll never come up to God's standard. But because you're so proud and so self-righteous, these Jewish people, Paul is saying, you've, you've despised the meaning of the prophets. You killed the Messiah. You fulfilled the, 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 the prophecies about his crucifixion in your ignorance. And you've told the, you've told the world that Tell the world his disciples came and stole him by night while we slept. We'll pay you. We'll keep you safe. We'll have a word with the governor. And the lie has spread, hasn't it? And now he's speaking to these people. And he's addressing the people belonging to the, to the Jews and, and all of their, their connections and all that they had sought to do. And They'll never stop the work of the Lord. No one will. No one can. But that doesn't mean that the work of the Lord will stay in a place doesn't mean that at all. What happens here, they go. And by them going, it doesn't mean, oh, well, they've, they've come and gone. Peace and quiet now. It's that God is taking the blessing away from them. You see what's happening? They shake the dust off their feet. Jesus said to do this, and it's symbolic expression of the dust be not worthy of sticking to their feet. Yeah, well, who on earth do they think they are? They don't think they're anyone. They are so consumed with God that they see their rejection not as personal. Couldn't care less about personal rejection. You see Paul throughout Acts, he's a man who will get back up when they think they've killed him and he wants to go back in the with the gospel. He doesn't care about his life. Neither do I count my life dear to myself, he says. That's a thought, isn't it? But when they're thrown out, and when they shake off the dust off their feet, what they're doing is saying the Lord is done with you. We're going. What a thought. What a thought, you know. And that, this is a question. Have we seen our time? Whatever we've seen in our nation, the islands, the western world, have we, have we had our time of gospel blessing historically? Are we trying to get it back? That's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a question to just think about. Or, or are, we, are we maybe on the edge of something? But we need to remember whatever it is, as the Lord only knows, that these people, the mission of the church moved when the people rejected it. Remember when Jesus healed and delivered a legion, the shores of uh, the, the Galilee. Remember, imagine seeing what, what, what had happened, how awful it was. I mean, to have seen this, to have seen a demonized man, a man so horrifically, you know, the, the, the man who was out of control physically, he was, he, was, he was really, 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 and he knew it himself. He tried to be crying in the tombs at night and cutting himself. He was trying to get rid of this thing going on inside him. Anyway, the Lord heals him amazingly. And then as... Um, the demons are, are cast into the pigs. They run off the edge of the cliff and into the sea. The farmers come around and people in the locality come around and they're seeing, they're seeing this man, doesn't it say, it's a thought, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Then it says this, and they were afraid. They were afraid. What did they say to Jesus? They said, go. <laughs> they were scared of him. And he left them. These people rejected the gospel 
over and over. They had the prophets. They grew up with the Bible, thought they knew it inside out. And the time comes when they've got the message, they've got the opportunity, and they've got all the Old Testament to prove them. And rather than accept what they're being told, they're going to think they're in the right. They're going to refuse to accept that, that they, could, they could possibly be wrong. And, and when the Lord is working among these people, and, and, and he's converting Sergius Paulus in Cyprus, if Satan tries to stop this man from hearing the word. He can't. The man who tries to stop him is judged. And the judgment is used in blessing Sergius Paulus, this important man. And as well in um, Antioch and Pisidia, the same thing we see happening. The Lord is converting people. He's moving in their hearts. He changes them. People are rejoicing, filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit in different places. But the gospel was going to the, to the Gentile world. We're part of the Gentile world. But it's to remember in God's plan, if you read, read Romans 11, in case it sounds a wee bit, a wee bit, you know, well, Romans 11 shows God has a New Testament plan of taking the gospel from the Jews to the Gentile world, the non-Jewish world, and when they've had their time, it's coming back to the Jews. Romans 11. And when it comes back to the Jews, in the wider context of the Bible, that may not be in a time of economic, political, and global stability. It may likely be in the midst of great trial and difficulty for the people of Israel. That's another thing we'll maybe think about, God willing, on Wednesday night, where, where we hope to continue. But, 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 but the, the, the point we're trying to, to take to ourselves and to remember is to never put this message away. Never put it out. Never even saying tomorrow. You know this, and I, and I really will finish. And I don't mean to, this isn't intentionally upsetting. Last congregation we were in, and uh, remember one, I don't think I'll ever forget it. The Sunday night, we're thinking of um, the flood, no one the flood. And there's a, one, one man there, um, he was connected to a family of who were, yeah, different generations of members and had been in the congregation. He wasn't a professing Christian or he wasn't a member in the church. He was a good fellow, a nice fellow. You know, and I remember saying, and I'm getting the shudder saying it on Sunday night, the thought of being lost and hearing, the thought of hearing an invitation from heaven to, be, to come to the Lord and to be saved. You know, the man dropped dead at work the next day. You know, and, and these things don't usually happen and it it's, it's just leaves you with that feeling. And we're always saying, push it away, someone else, some other time, some other place. We haven't a clue. And this really is the most important thing you will ever think about your whole life. What shall it profit a man, he says, if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Imagine. The most important thing, the most valuable thing is your soul. Who you are. Give it to the Lord. He wants it. He's asking for it. He doesn't need it. It's not that he needs any of us to enhance or make him feel better in any shape or form. But it's in order to bless you and to bless me. And that's what he's saying through these apostles. You judge yourselves unworthy of it. The choice is yours. That's how straightforward it is. The choice is yours. Don't fool about with it. Don't promise another second. But get right with him in his terms. Lord, help us. Let's pray. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to bow in your presence, to humble ourselves before you, and to thank you for giving us this time where we have your word before us again. Speak to us all, we pray. Turn all of our hearts to you. Take away all our sins. Lord, our God, you know that we look on no one else in, in the judgment or the criticism of the Pharisee. And anything we try to say, we include ourselves at the top of the list, at the front of the line. And I think that's what Paul was meaning when he, when he spoke of himself as being, when he said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The grace that you show is amazing and the miracle for us to be here. May we be blessed as we wait upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our last singing, we can turn to Psalm 2, the second Sam and Scottish Psalter.
page 201, 201, Psalm 2, Psalm 2, Scottish Psalter at verse 7. The sure decree I will declare the Lord hath said to me, Thou art mine only son, this day I have begotten thee. Let's sing to the end from, from verse 7, Psalm 2, the, Lord, the sure decree I will declare. The sure decree I will declare, the Lord hath said to me, Thou art mine only Son, this day I have been. Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.